Hey YouTube, Untamed here. So today I'm gonna to talk through the pros and cons of the brand new 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser. And what's special about this video compared to all the other videos out there on YouTube is I'm gonna shoot you straight. I'm gonna talk through the negatives. I've read a bunch of comments from you guys. I've gotten a pretty good idea of how a lot of you are truly feeling about the brand new 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser. And I'm gonna talk through those. And I think a lot of the complaints that some of you have there's some merit behind it. So I'm gonna talk through the pros and cons. I am gonna start with the good. <laughs> then we're gonna wrap up with what I think is the bad and what I've gathered from all of you. To be fair, I have not seen it in person. I've not actually gotten behind the steering wheel of the brand new Land Cruiser. So take some of this with a grain of salt if we're being honest with each other. But everything you're seeing on YouTube right now, mainly and, and online in general, is from people that were invited to that event out in Utah. So they're kind of being hand fed this information directly from Toyota, not to mention a fully covered expense trip out to Utah for this wonderful event. So they're, they're very smart. They don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. So you're getting that kind of feedback. I'll shoot you straight in this video and I'd like to get your honest feedback. So we're going to answer that question. Is the brand new 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser a knockout or is it a knockoff Land Cruiser? Let's answer that question. So let me start with the good and everything that I've gathered and in my true opinion of it as well. So the most important thing to know is the price tag, of course. I won't beat that to death. We all know that it's going to start in the mid $50,000 range, and that's awesome. I think a lot of people who have always liked the Land Cruiser, that was their driving gripe. It's always cost way too much money. And now it's a very affordable option for a lot of people to actually get into, which I love that. So that is absolutely the biggest pro. I won't beat it to death. Number two, the design and heritage cues all throughout. I personally like it. I like it. And I actually prefer the rectangular headlights. And I think most of you guys actually like the circular headlights is what I've gathered from a lot of, a lot of the feedback anyway. So I really like the, you know, their, their, uh, their tries to really connect back to the original Land Cruisers of the past and like the FJ40, you know, including the white top on it. I think that looks awesome. I do really appreciate the fact that they're offering three trims right out of the gate. It's not just one or two. Yeah, three different options. Of course, you have the 1958 edition, which honestly is my favorite. And, and unfortunately, it's the one that does not come with the rectangular headlights. But I really, really like the extra simplicity of that 1958 edition uh, to include those cloth seats. And as a dad of four children, that is a very rare thing to ever hear <laughs> out, of, out of my mouth. And I actually do think it is pretty cool. Uh, hopefully, you know, you can scotch guard it and it would actually be pretty, pretty well protected. Um, so I do love the, the simplicity of the 1958. You have then the mid-tier, which is the Land Cruiser uh, trim. And then you have the first edition, which is going to be limited to 5,000 units. And let's just call it what it is. That's going to be the additional dealer markup edition because dealerships are already licking their chops waiting to get the first edition so they can charge 20 grand over a sticker. We all know that's going to happen, unfortunately. But I do appreciate all that to say, three different options right out of the gate. Um, I love the fact that it has that classic Toyota Heritage script, you know, in and out, but of course on the front grille, I think that looks awesome. And really just the overall shape and side profile of it. It does scream Land Cruiser. So they have made a very conscious effort to, to really drop back to the original Land Cruiser of the, of the past and throughout history. So I love that. You can tell that they also put functionality over everything. So when you look at the front bumper, we talked about this briefly in a previous video, the front bumper has modular components or different pieces, various pieces to that front bumper. When you look at it at first, you're like, okay, it kind of maybe, maybe seems a little overdone and, and borderline unnecessary, but it is kind of cool if you were to take that off-roading and you bump the front bumper or scuff it or hang it up on a rock, it is nice to know that you can probably fix that one small component rather than swapping out and repainting your entire front bumper. So I do appreciate Toyota's effort to do that. They want people to get out there and take these vehicles off-roading. So that is pretty cool. And the final thing I'll throw in with this design and heritage cues section is the FJ Cruiser side mirrors. So I think that, again, a very small touch, but I think that's pretty cool that they, they match that kind of that, uh, rectangular uh, side mirrors. Good luck. Next up is the off-road prowess. Of course, this is huge. Uh, and I think we're, we're gonna be pleasantly surprised by its performance off-road. So I do appreciate that they continued to make the Land Cruiser a full-time four-wheel drive, right? So that is continuing to be the case. It has a center and rear diff lock, which is awesome. We'd almost expect that at this point. It has crawl control, which is a super swanky tool. If you've never used it, it really is pretty incredible. 
multi-terrain selection on the higher trims I think is in a Land Cruiser trim upward you do have the multi-terrain selection and I also love the fact that it does have disconnectable front sway bar so that is pretty cool so I mean similar to what you would find within the KDSS the kinetic dynamic suspension system that you'd find on your TRD off-road or the Land Cruiser of the past the 200 series uh, it allows that front sway bar to disconnect itself to allow for better art wheel articulation off-roading so I do love that they implemented that as well and perhaps most obviously the smaller size of it is a good thing it makes it a little bit more nimble so if you are going to be off-roading it and taking it through tighter trails you don't have to worry about you know, getting too many pinstripes on it which is pretty cool excellent visibility again kind of tying into the off-road prowess being able to see all the obstacles that you're coming up on all throughout it it's like you're in a fishbowl and i think that is pretty cool and that's always been kind of a land cruiser staple uh honestly throughout throughout the years uh, adding to the excellent visibility, now we of course get the, the 360 degree cameras, which has almost become a standard too with new off-road vehicles, but again, adding to your confidence off-road. Um, so those are the good factors, and you know, of course, it's still made in Japan, that's awesome, uh, and we're likely going to be seeing it probably spring of 2024 is when we're going to actually start seeing it become available, so not too much longer of a wait. Let's talk through, let's talk through the bad. This is the stuff that we're not really dissecting too much. You might hear it kind of sprinkled in with other reviews, but it's always like lightly touched on and then kicked to the positive. All right, so the most obvious, of course, and I'll spend the least amount of time on this, and that is the one engine option we get. Okay, I think a lot of us thought, myself included, we thought that there was, it was going to match the GX550 when it comes to the power plant, especially if they're going to continue to have the 4Runner as an option. If they create a, a sixth generation 4Runner, I thought they were going to match the 3.4 liter twin turbo V6 that we find in that GX550, the, the new Lexus coming out. Uh, so I was shocked to see that that V6 isn't even an option. We only get the 2.4 liter iForce Max. Although, to be fair, it does crank out pretty impressive numbers, 326 horsepower and 465 horsepower, if I recall correctly. So that is impressive. I think we can tow up to 6,000 pounds, which is still uh, even better than the naturally aspirated six, or excuse me, the naturally aspirated four liter V6 that we have in the current 4Runner, uh, which allows you to tow up to 5,000 pounds. So, and, and way more horsepower, way more torque than that previous naturally aspirated for the record too. Um, but, you know, I just, I, I like a lot of you, I see your comments here. I think we're all kind of quick to gripe about that because um, normally speaking, it's a hybrid power plant like that, that iForce Max, it doesn't inspire a whole lot of confidence when it comes to longevity, right? So it never, never really does. You know, you got the, uh, what is it? The, um, I'm gonna mess up the name of it, but it's a nickel battery uh, that it has within it. And I just, yeah, I have a hard time believing that that is gonna crank out a quarter million miles or 300, 400,000 miles on that original battery. So I just have that hard time believing that and having full confidence in that. And I know a lot of you guys do too. So. I think when it comes to longevity, less is more, right? And that's why the naturally aspirated uh, power plants tend to do a little bit better, historically speaking. But for emission standards and all that stuff, you know, we're making these transitions, right? So I don't want to totally be closed-minded to it, and I encourage you not to be as well. But again, I'm with you on that. I'm not too excited about it at this point in time. Um, let's move on. Sorry, I spent too much time on that. Okay, so moving on, the fact that it does not have a split hatch in the back I think that lands at some some uh, some foul points there. That is no good. I think a lot of us were were hoping that they would continue the split hatch option. We know that we didn't see that in the 300 series, but still. But when you look at the back of the the 2024, the 250 series that we're getting, uh, it looks as though it could very well be a split hatch. And I think a lot of us thought that based on the teaser images, right? But unfortunately, no. It's your standard uh, lift hatch out back. The fact that it does not have a third row option lands it uh, uh, some more negative points, I think. So again, it's just going to be limited to a five-seater, uh, uh, you know, front and front and second row five-seater vehicle. The wheels are garbage and a half. I think they're pretty pathetic looking, and I think I've seen that a lot of a lot of feedback from you guys on that too. But again, let's face it: what's among the first modifications that we all make to our vehicles? That tends to be wheels and tires. We always swap out for a wheel and tire package. So I think that is borderline a moot point, but again, that is a very clear representation of Toyota trying to cut costs and actually provide some savings to the consumer. So a little bit of a pro and con to that. 
Um, another example of that, again, is a small thing, but like a prop hood up front. You don't have the, the struts opening up your front hood. Instead, we get the manual prop with a very heavy hood. Um, I digress. The elevated cargo space out back. So again, I've heard a couple people talk about this briefly, but this is, I find this to be a pretty annoying thing. The fact that you know, that battery out back, the nickel metal hydrate pack is a hydrate pack is what they call it, I think. Um, that is right underneath the cargo space out back. And it elevates that cargo space quite a bit, in my opinion, based on the videos I've seen in photos anyway. Again, I haven't seen it in, in the flesh. That seems, I don't know, that really takes away from the cargo space and the ease of getting in and out of it, putting stuff in and out of it. I don't love that. So the elevated cargo space is a huge detriment in my personal opinion. And the overarching cheapness of the interior. And a lot of people are kind of commenting on the cheapness and plasticiness of the exterior too, deviating a lot from previous Land Cruisers. So a lot of people don't like that, but especially on the interior. Very, very plasticky on the inside. So folks are not loving that by the looks of it and sounds of it. However, again, to be fair, I know I'm talking on both sides of my mouth, but I'm kind of doing it on purpose. A lot of people hated that with the FJ Cruiser that we had recently. The one that left us in 2014, people hated the, 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 the super rubbery, plasticky interior. It looked like a freaking toy on the inside for a lot of people when they saw it for the first time. Some people appreciated the simplicity of it, but most people didn't love it at first. However, people quickly became to really, really appreciate that unique factor about it and the simplicity. It allowed it to age well uh, to some degree. So... All that to say, things that we may not love here at the beginning, myself included, are, may become our most, or our favorite things about the vehicle moving forward, okay? And I think at the end of the day, as I see a lot of the feedback from a lot of people, I think we are comparing it to the 200 series a little bit too much. Uh, and we gotta remind ourselves that this is not the progression of the 200 series. This is you know, technically the, the, the Prado version of it, the 250 series. So it is that in between. It's a little bit smaller too, four and a half inches less wide than the 200 series. So it isn't that the big dog. And I think we need to remind ourselves of that. Um, you know, it's just, I think it's, it's, I think a lot of people historically, this is me kind of on my personal experience with the Land Cruiser. I've owned a few heritage editions. I think a ton of people have loved, always loved the Land Cruiser. And then there's like a cult following behind it. But that group of people who love the Land Cruiser and kind of idolize it are also not the people who are buying it either. So I've, I've realized that having tried to sell it a couple times too, there's a very, very small market. There was a very, very small market, a niche group of people uh, who are actually putting their money where their mouth is when it comes to buying that Land Cruiser, the 200 series. I think there's a ton of people that love it, but the percentage of that group of people that actually were out there trying to buy it and actually getting them, very, very small. So we're getting away from that. Honestly, Toyota answered, answered the request of most people. I've been doing Land Cruiser videos for a long time, and at so many times I'd see people commenting, I'm talking years back at this point, who would always comment, man, I just wish you know, it would offer a Land Cruiser with you know, a little bit more bare bones, and you know, starting maybe in the 50, maybe $40,000 range, you know, having a manual option, you know, very bare bones, that is what we want. You know, they, they came in too high with the premium editions, the Heritage and the, the base model that are in the mid 80s to $90,000. That was out of reach for most people, most Americans. So a lot of people would always request, man, I wish we could find one that was just affordable. Affordable and cheaper and simplistic. That's kind of what they did. That's kind of what Toyota offered us. And now we're, <laughs> now that same group of people who's been saying that are the ones who were comparing it to the 200 series. Like, oh wait, this is too far off from the 200 series. Well, we're not going to be getting something of the 200 series caliber for $55,000. That's just not going to happen, unfortunately. So hopefully, all this to say, I do hope someday soon we will see the 300 series roll over to the United States. I'm, I don't know, I, I'm not too hopeful on it just because I know how far backlog their order system is for the 300 series worldwide. And they're already trying to catch out. I think they're already pre-sold out like a year and a half to two years right now around the world. And they're trying to keep up with that production and they can't. So them offering it to the United States only hinders it. Unless they created a new plant, a new manufacturing plant somewhere, perhaps that could be an option for it. But all that to say, the 300 series is probably going to be years down the road if we end up getting it here in the United States. So 
there you have it guys. I kind of just dissected you know, the, the bad, the pitfalls of it that I've really seen, kind of hinted at in various different videos. But again, I kind of just want to list off them all together and, and get your collective feedback. Do you really think that this Land Cruiser is going to be a smashing success, even with that iForce Max four-cylinder engine that we're going to be getting in it? Or do you think it's a little bit of a knockoff? A knockoff to satisfy the, you know, the, the, the us dumb Americans who are just going to buy up anything that will last a few years and then swap it out for the next version of it. Whereas, historically speaking, you buy that Land Cruiser to last 25 plus years with minimal maintenance and minimal issue. So do you think that this new 250 series is that? Let me know what your thoughts are. Appreciate you watching as always. Till next time.